few years ago, Lindsay and I got these plug-in devices. I don't know if you've gotten them or not, where you plug them in your car and your insurance company sends them to you and they say, we're not going to raise your rate, but we might lower your rate if you, depending on how well you drive. And so uh, they monitor your driving habits. They lower your insurance. They, uh, they help the insurance companies gather metadata so they can determine whether your city is dangerous or not, which is, I think, probably the whole purpose of it. But we were living in Miami. And Miami has some of the worst drivers in the entire country. There are 120 languages spoken in the public schools in Miami, and there are 120 languages driven on the roads of Miami. Everybody drives according to the uh, country that they immigrated from and whatever those laws are. It's, it's a horrible place to drive. And anybody who ever visits there from out of town will tell you, I mean, it just it was maddening to drive there. So trying not to stop on a dime or turn quickly or accelerate quickly because this little thing is monitoring everything you do, it's, it's virtually impossible. And so uh, it would beep, especially when you stop too fast. It would beep and let you know you stopped too fast. And so mine would beep all the time. And Lindsay and I were, were riding together one day, and I was driving her car. And I said, you know that thing, it beeps all the time. She's like, mine rarely beeps. So I made a decision. Hers needed to beep. So I just started stopping real quickly and making it beep. She's like, don't do that. <laughs> So it's not fair. I, I, dri I drive more than you do, and so, you know, mine beeps all the time, and I had to, I go to a lot of places, and so, anyway, we, we had a lot of fun with it. She, she really was upset that I was making, uh, making her, her driving not look so good, but it kind of became a game for us, but it, it got me thinking about um, a traffic ticket, okay? So you get a traffic ticket, maybe you're speeding and you get caught speeding, but maybe you get a traffic ticket and you weren't speeding. It happens. And, and maybe you have some kind of proof that you weren't speeding and you show up at the, before the judge and you say to the judge, I wasn't speeding. Here's the proof. I don't know what that proof might be, but here's the proof that I wasn't speeding and I shouldn't have to pay this ticket. And, and maybe the judge agrees with you that, okay, you, you're right. You were not speeding. Here's proof that you weren't speeding. And so we're going to drop this ticket. And at that point, you would be justified before that judge. You would be right in right standing with the law before that judge. But what if that judge said, now you weren't speeding, but we have here this little device that's been plugged into your car for the last three months. We ran it through our computers and we found out that, yes, on this particular occasion, you weren't speeding. But do you know how many times a day you actually break the speed limit? Because there's a record there of every other time that a police officer didn't have a radar on you, that you were speeding. And I thought about how it's kind of hypocritical for us. You know, maybe you grew up with, with parents like I did who, if you were getting a spanking for something and you said, well, hey, I, I really didn't do this, they said, well, this is for something else you did do that we didn't catch you doing, you know. And so I kind of thought about that and the whole speeding ticket thing. Here we stand and go, well, I wasn't speeding, I wasn't speeding that time. <laughs> but there are other times where I've gone over the speed limit. Well, that, that leads me to what I want, to, want us to see in this passage because that idea of, okay, I was right in this instance, but if you see the whole sum of everything, then I really can't make this claim that I am always right and that I always do what is right. So what I want us to see tonight in this passage is that our best will never be enough to earn the favor of God, but those who place their faith in Jesus will become truly and completely righteous. So Jesus says in this passage, Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. This is a sobering passage. I mean, this is a passage that ought to make us stand up, take note, and ask a lot of hard questions. I mean, when Jesus says you will never enter the kingdom of heaven given this particular condition, I mean, we should stop and pray and ask God, Lord, help me understand what this passage is teaching us. So that's what I want to do tonight. Let's unpack this passage a little at a time. First, that first state, phrase, unless your righteousness exceeds. I just really want to look at those two words, righteousness and exceeds. That first word, righteousness, means a righteous, uh, means rightness, means you're right, or a right standing before God. 
Uh, it's, the, it's the noun form of the verb justified. And justified is a legal term. So it's the same word. These two words, we see them translated in the Scripture differently. But, but justified, justification, righteousness, they're all the same word, just translated different ways given the context. And so it means you are justified in, in a court of law. You come to a court of law, and the court of law says, we find you not guilty. We have weighed out all the evidence, and we find you not guilty. You are just in your actions, and so we find you not guilty. Um, it's, it's this idea that, uh, that you have, in particular in the Scripture, that you have right standing with God, that the courtroom we're speaking of is the eternal courtroom that you are standing before God and you have now a just, not guilty, and right standing before God. It's a very important uh, word. And sometimes it's used individually of us and our standing before God. Sometimes it's used of our, um, our obligation to extend righteousness, to make things as just and as right as we can on the earth so that, um, so that the earth, as much as possible, before the return of Jesus, reflects the kingdom of God as it is in heaven, you know, on earth as it is in heaven. And so our obligation as Christians to be for just causes, to be for righteous causes, to make sure that people are treated justly and, and fairly. But in this passage, it's that individual application. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So it's that idea of you standing before God and now your righteousness is being measured. There's a scale there. And there are, there's you and there's the Pharisees. And so your personal standing with God. Well, what does this word exceeds? It means that it goes over and above or it goes beyond. Uh, it abounds. There's that biblical word. Sometimes this word is translated as abound. You know, God's grace abounds more and more. As sin abounds, God's grace abounds more and more. So it's just that idea that if you stand next to somebody and you stand as tall as you can, that that person is taller than you. They go above and beyond you. It's they exceed who you are. So in other words, according to be a, uh, in order to be a part of God's kingdom, our righteousness must go beyond some standard. Some standard. What standard? In this passage, Jesus says it's the scribes and the Pharisees. Um, everyone has a standard. Everyone has some kind of standard. And, and they may not even verbalize it. They may not have ever thought about it. But they have some standard. Maybe that standard is what they think God requires, but maybe they don't even believe in God and they just have some kind of standard as to how, in general, a person should be and what makes a person moral or immoral. We all have a standard. It's usually set either by themselves, and I think most often by themselves. Uh, in other words, well, whatever the standard is, I'm above it. So I'm not sure where to draw the line, but I know I'm past the line and I'm good. I'm in the good. And this goes from the most righteous, you know, outwardly righteous, good people, if you will, among us, all the way down to the most wicked people. There are very few people, although there are a handful, but there are very few people who think that they don't somehow surpass the qualification for righteousness or morality or, or however they define being right. Most people think, although they don't think of themselves as perfect, they think that they definitely pass the threshold of being who you morally need to be. I'm talking people on death row, people, uh, people who commit horrendous acts. They have a way of kind of rationalizing those things away. But we also need to think about it. I mean, if it's something they do, and we can clearly see that they have violated a standard that they would in no way be considered righteous by any fair standard, then we need to think about us. If they're deceived in that way, then maybe we are deceived in that way. So it's usually set either by themselves or by someone they respect. So someone that the world looks at and says, well, Billy Graham was a great man of God. Mother Teresa was a humanitarian saint. And so we look at those people and say, well, that's a standard. And, and, and if I'm close enough to them, I might not be them, but if I'm close enough to them, then maybe I'm okay and maybe I'm doing all right. Or it could be someone they consider to be less righteous. Well, that person seems to be okay, and I know I'm much better than them. And, you know, this happens a lot with people who, who leave church because of hypocrisy. They say, well, I'm not going down there to church with all those hypocrites. And let's just be honest. We all know what a hypocrite is. A hypocrite is someone who says one thing and does another. And all Christians uh, at some point in their life, and some in some ways on a regular basis, we say one thing and we do another. I heard another pastor say one time, 
if, you're, if a pastor is not a hypocrite, then he's not really preaching the whole truth of God's word. Because the truth of God's word, laid, the standards laid out in God's word and the truth of the gospel and the depth of the gospel is so amazing that if you are preaching what you can live up to, then you're not preaching the full true gospel. And I think there's some truth to that. So people say, well, I'm leaving the church because I know even those teachers down there, that preacher down there, you know, I, I saw him out and he cut somebody off in traffic and he had just preached about being patient the week before. And, and so they find somebody who they think is less, and I'm better than them, but I don't even go to church. So, uh, so they find somebody who they think is less righteous than them and that's how they set their standard. But, but would it really make any sense to set a standard by a person? Would it really make sense to say, the way that I will determine whether I am right with God is by comparing myself to myself or to some other person? It doesn't make any sense. Why? Because we have no idea if that person's right with God. We can't say from the outside looking in because we're not God. We cannot set God's standard of righteousness for him. Only God can set that standard. That's why Jesus in this passage basically says, whatever standard you have, it's too low. Why did he say scribes and Pharisees? If he were speaking to us today, would he say scribes and Pharisees? He might. But he said scribes and Pharisees because in the minds of the people, I mean, there was no one more righteous than them. And, and so he uses that to, to kind of wake them up that the standard is here is really high. So Jesus today might say, unless your righteousness exceeds that of Billy Graham and Mother Teresa, then you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. So what Jesus teaches us is that our righteousness, if we're going to make it into the kingdom of heaven, if we're going to be a part of the kingdom of heaven, has to be a righteousness that really exceeds any standard we could find, any person that we could look around and see other than Jesus himself. So our righteousness must exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees. You know, we think of these as spiritual bad guys. I mean, they're the spiritual bad guys. You know, if you grow up in church, it's, uh, they're always the, the scribes and the Pharisees. They're always tripping all over themselves, and they're always, Jesus always makes them look foolish. And, you know, we preach a lot against Phariseeism, that kind of thing. But in the first century, they were thought of as the most spiritual and righteous people in Israel. So scribes, scribes were professional scholars. They studied scripture for a living. They copied scripture. They memorized large chunks of scripture. They uh, more than likely had all memorized the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, uh, which is a monumental task in and of itself. And they spent their time all day, every day, answering questions about the Bible. That's what they did. They were professional Bible scholars. They were well-educated they were well, uh, well respected. Pharisees, Pharisees, especially Pharisees, we think of them as the as the religious bad guys. But really, they were what we would call the conservatives. So Israel was broken up into several different parties or groups. These were political religious parties. At that time, it was really hard to separate the political from the religious. And the Pharisees, they were one of those parties. Mainly, there were two. There were several others, but the main two were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And so when you look at those two parties, uh, two groups in Israel, um, let, let's just say it this way. If we were voting for a candidate, we would say, well, I'm going to vote for the Pharisee. Why? Because he actually believes the Hebrew Scriptures are God's Word. The, the Sadducees only believed the first five books were God's Word. Uh, he believes in the resurrection. The Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection. He tries to live out the law where the Sadducees just go down to the temple and they think it's all about the ritual. It doesn't really matter how you live. What matters is as long as you go through the temple rituals, then everything is okay. The law is really not that important. So, I mean, the Pharisee is our guy. I mean, he believes the Bible is God's word. He believes we ought to live according to it. And, and he does his best to live out the Mosaic law. And, you know, Jesus even... Uh, said this about the scribes, about the Pharisees and the scribes in Matthew 23, 2 through 3. You have it there in your, um, in your listing guide. The scribes and Pharisees sit on Moses' seat, so do and observe whatever they tell you. Okay, so Jesus himself says they teach in some ways. Now he did highlight some of the deficiencies of their teaching, but he said in general they teach the law. They teach scripture. They teach you what you ought to do. So they observe the law. Not only do they teach the law, they observe the law to extreme measures. So Jesus, on another occasion, Matthew 23, 23, just a few verses down, uh, 
He gives them a warning. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites. Why? For you tithe mint and dill and cumin. Okay, what are those? Those are really small spice plants. Some of you might grow those. If you, can, if you do grow those or if you know what they look like, imagine going out in your backyard where you grow these spices and counting the leaves. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, plucking the tenth one and saying, this goes to the temple. One, two, three, four, five, six, plucking the tenth leaf. This goes to the temple. They did that. They, they were that careful about their observance of the law, but they failed miserably in other areas. You tithe the mint and the dill and the cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. These you ought to have done without neglecting the others. So we shouldn't just write them off as completely unrighteous people in the sense of moral goodness. I mean, these were morally good people in some ways. They had an outward righteousness, but that was not reflected by a heart of righteousness. Matthew 23, 28 says of them, Jesus says of them, outwardly you appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Externally, you got it all together. Inside, it's falling apart. Just before this, Jesus compares them to a whitewashed tomb, a grave that looks really good. We might would say a pressure-washed gravestone. So it's newly clean. The letters have been redone. It looks really good, but it is simply death on the inside. So we can easily look at the scribes and Pharisees, but, but let me ask you a question. What about you? What about me? If we were to kind of hold ourselves to that same standard. So I don't think we can rest in this idea that, well, I'm not like the scribes and Pharisees. Yeah, I don't have it all together, always on the outside, but on the inside, I'm, I'm a, a, a basically a good person. Well, how would your righteousness compare to that of the scribes and the Pharisees? Do you keep all the commandments God intended us to keep? Do you keep not, and you say, well, that's, that's old covenant pastor. Well, what about the new covenant commands? We talked about that in last session. There's a lot of commands in the New Testament. There are a lot of do's and don'ts in the New Testament. So do you keep them all? Uh, do you sometimes look like you're righteous on the outside, but are actually far from God or even actively sinning on the inside? I think all Christians go through stages in our walk with the Lord where we know how to play the game. We know how to come to church and say the right things. And we don't know how to make it look like we've got it all together on the outside, but on the inside, there's no spiritual life there. That In that moment, in that season even, there's nothing there. And maybe we're even actively sinning. So it can be easy for us to dismiss the scribes and Pharisees as hypocrites with only an exterior righteousness. But the truth is that often describes us. And the stakes are really high. Because what did Jesus say? Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. There's no way around this being a heavy statement. And one thing that I've committed to do as a preacher is to never dull the sharp statement that Jesus intended. We ought, we ought to let statements like this rest on us. We ought to feel the weight of it. Jesus did not come along in this sermon and say, but, but wait, but there's grace. Certainly there is, but we ought to live under the weight of this statement. We ought to see the seriousness of righteousness. Righteousness and right standing before God is an eternally serious matter. But you know, it leads us to this question, how then can anybody be saved? I mean, how is it possible? Unless your righteousness exceeds that of Billy Graham and Mother Teresa, how then can any be saved? You know, and, and the truth is, I, I bet if you were to really talk with Billy, Billy would say this. You ought to say it this way. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of which the world thought Billy Graham's righteousness was. Because I bet if you talk to Billy, he would be the first one to tell you, you know, the world knew me but, but there were issues in my life that people never knew. They might not be outright blatant sin or any sin that would disqualify him from ministry, but I bet there were dry times in his life. 
I bet there were times where he looked like he had it all together on the outside, but on the inside he didn't. And I bet he would tell you, you know, there were times in my life where I neglected the most important things, but the world had a, per, a perception of me that made it look like I had it all together. And so Billy Graham would even tell you the same thing. In fact, somebody gave an illustration um, once uh, that really struck home with me. It really stuck with me. And that was if getting to heaven were a swimming contest and you were a better swimmer based off of your righteousness. So you would think of a good person. You know, some we mentioned uh, some good people in your life and, and you'd say, yeah, I know they were a really good person and, and they might be, you know, they might be able to swim several miles, might be able to swim several miles. And then, you know, Mother Teresa, I mean, she can, she can backstroke for 70, 80, 90, 100 miles. You know, and then, of course, Billy Graham just walks on water. He can walk for, you know, three, four, five hundred miles. I mean, he can, he can go a while. And that's all well and good, but what if the contest is you've got to swim from California to Hawaii? It doesn't really matter how good of a swimmer you are. You're not going to make it. Uh, your abilities, no matter how good they are, are not going to get you there. And that's really what we're looking at. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. It reminds me of Martin Luther, 1510. The Protestant Reformation was started in some ways in 1517 when Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the door at Wittenberg. But in 1510, Martin Luther took a trip to Rome and he was struggling with his own sense of righteousness. He had a real struggle. He could not understand it. And he was already a, a very outwardly righteous person. He was a monk. He already... Um, did many more things than most Christians ever do in their life as far as outward righteousness, spiritual disciplines. He was a very outwardly righteous guy, but he knew he wasn't right with God. He was reading the standards given in Scripture, and he knew he wasn't doing that. And so he goes to Rome, and in Rome there is a set of stairs called the Sacred Stairs. Uh, they've been brought from Jerusalem, and supposedly these are the stairs that Jesus walked down after he was condemned by Pilate. Nobody knows that for sure, uh, personally, I, I doubt that those are the stair. That's the staircase that Jesus walked down. But at the time, most people believed that that was the case. And there was this belief that if you wanted to uh, be right with God, there was a way to do it. You could go to these stairs, and you could uh, get on your knees and climb up these stairs on your knees and pray at every stair step. You could stop and say a Hail Mary and an Our Father. And if you would do that for all of these steps, every step gave you one year of forgiveness of sins. So one year of your life, the sins were washed away. Uh, there, were, there were 25 steps on this staircase. It's still there, still 25 steps. And so as, if you went up once, that's 25 years. Most people would go up twice. The life expectancy at that time was somewhere around 50 years or so. So if I go up it twice, that will cover every year of my life. So Martin Luther did this. He went and he knelt. And he climbed up those stairs. And when he got to the top of the stairs, it wasn't a sense of relief that overcame him. It was a sense of dread. Here's why. He said, this can't be it. If I am to earn my righteousness before God, it can't be that it would come by getting on my knees and saying prayers and climbing up to the top of the stairs. And that was part of the process that led him to this discovery, if you will, of justification by faith. Uh, this idea that, that we can't do anything to bring us close to God, but that there had to be another way. So among many of the passages that were so important to us in this thought is Romans chapter 3. I've given it for you there in your worship guide so you can see. It's a fairly long passage. I want you to read through the entire passage, and I want to highlight a few things. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. So think about what Paul's saying there. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Spoken to those under the law, spoken to those seeking their righteousness and their rightness with God by the law. And Paul says it's given to us so that every mouth may be stopped, so that even the mouths of the scribes and Pharisees would be stilled before God and that they would recognize not even their own righteousness. Because keep in mind in this passage, the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees is not the standard. They're not good enough. It has to exceed 
that standard. Then verse 20, For by the works of the law no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. I hope as we've walked through this and, and you particularly feel the weight of that statement that you think, I am guilty. There has to be another way or all hope is lost. So you feel the weight of your sin. That's what Paul says is the function of that, one of the functions of the law. Through the law comes knowledge of sin. I suddenly recognize that I am a sinner. I am not right with God and there's nothing that I can in any way do to make up for that. I can't get on my knees and walk up a staircase. I can't come to church enough. I can't get baptized enough. I can't have perfect attendance in, in my life group or give enough money to missions. None of that, n none of that will get me there. And the law, purpose of the law is to nail us down on that. So that we'll see, verse 21, there's another way. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and prophets bear witness to it. This is not undoing the law and prophets. This is fulfilling the law and prophets. Verse 22, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. Those are really great verses. We're not going to unpack them tonight, but I do want you to see verses 26 through 28. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. How can God rightly look over our sin and be just? And how can God not look over our sin and declare us to be righteous? Only in the gospel. Only in the truth that Jesus took the punishment for us. He was our propitiation. He was our substitute. And he stood in our place and bore the wrath of God for our sin. So that God can do two things. He can maintain his justice. He doesn't, he doesn't change his just standards. But he can also declare us to be righteous. He can justify us. Then verse 27. What becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of law. Matthew 5.20 should scream to us, there has to be another way. If it is up to me and my righteousness to inherit the kingdom of heaven, I will not do it. There must be another way. And it preps our heart to know that there is another way. But there's also a second purpose for this passage. Martin Luther spoke of two kinds of righteousness. He spoke of external righteousness and internal righteousness. External righteousness being that that is outside of us. So it has to be given to us. We can't get it. We can't generate it. It's given to us. He actually called it alien righteousness. It comes in from the outside. It's the righteousness of Jesus. It's just given to us. By God, it is placed on us when we place our faith in Jesus. But then he spoke of an, ex an internal righteousness. And that is the fruit of the, the external righteousness. So it's what results from being given this righteous state in Jesus. And it's the fruit that leads us to live faithfully and obediently in response to the gospel. So Matthew 5.20 is written so that we would see our need for external righteousness, there's no way we're going to get it unless God gives it to us. And it would help us understand the internal righteousness God then calls us to live out. Because what I'm saying is, it's, it's interesting. We can't be righteous and that leads us to God. We can't do it, so it leads us to the grace and mercy of God. It leads us to the gospel. But then when we come to the gospel, this amazing thing happens. God transforms us from the inside out, and we start to actually live out some of those things that we couldn't do before we came to Christ. The very thing that drives us to our need for God now, because we can't get those victories, now becomes victories that we see in our heart and our life. And this is a lifelong process. It's a process, in fact, that won't be completed until the Lord brings us home and gives us new bodies and completely recreates this sinful flesh, but we do see it in stages as we walk in our 
uh, in our relationship with God. And sometimes it's small steps. Sometimes it's baby steps that we see growth in. Sometimes we feel like we're just standing still, but we just happen to be facing the right direction. Uh, that, is, uh, that is the way sometimes our Christian life feels. But then other times, it's like we're sprinting 5, 10, 20 miles at a time, and we're just growing so fast in our walk with the Lord, and we're seeing God just really do a work in us that we couldn't imagine. But the, the fact is that when we're given this righteousness, it leads us to a point where we start to actually live out what we never could have lived out before. So in that way, our righteousness really does start to outpace that of the scribes and Pharisees in some way because now we're actually being shaped into the image of Jesus. Who is it that is the only person whose righteousness ever lived up to the standard that God sets here? It's Jesus. And who is it that God promises he will shape us into the image of? Jesus. So as we come to him, and we live out the faith, and we obey him, he will shape us into those men and women whose righteousness actually exceeds that of scribes and Pharisees.